Hi class, welcome to chapter four, the carbohydrates. We're gonna be talking about sugars, starches, and fibers. So just think, what types of foods contain carbohydrates and what types of foods do not? A lot of times when people think of carbohydrates, they think of sugar and candy and sweets and maybe honey and syrup, but there's a lot of foods that don't necessarily taste sweet that contain carbohydrates, such as starches, rice, potatoes, pasta, bread, cereals. Also, many different fruits and vegetables contain carbohydrates. Fruits are sweet and more obvious, but vegetables such as beans, legumes also have carbohydrates, and then dairy also has some carbohydrate in it. For example, lactose is a carbohydrate found in milk. Foods that do not have carbohydrates are protein foods, so generally animal foods, and fats like oils. Carbohydrates are composed of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, and the name carbohydrate comes from carbo for carbon and hydro hydrate for with water. How do we draw these chemical structures as we're talking about different macronutrients? So we use the abbreviations that represent the chemical molecules. For example, H is hydrogen, C is carbon, O is oxygen, N is nitrogen. And these abbreviations come from the periodic table of elements. Depending on the element, they can form different numbers of bonds. Hydrogens form one, oxygens two, nitrogens three, and carbons four. And those bonds are drawn by lines coming off of the element. So you can see the lines in red. If you see a double line, that indicates a double bond. Carbohydrates can be classified as either simple carbohydrates or complex carbohydrates. And simple carbohydrates are very small molecules made up of less complicated bonds. Complex carbohydrates are very long molecules made up of more intricate bonds. Simple carbohydrates include sugars, monosaccharides, disaccharides, and complex carbohydrates include star starches and fiber which are considered polysaccharides. Mono means one sugar, di means two sugars, and poly means multiple sugars. There are also oligosaccharides, which is many, many, many sugars. So generally, simple carbohydrates are easier to digest and absorb. Complex carbohydrates digest and absorb much more slowly, and fiber does not absorb at all. Although pictured here, bread, cereal, grains are under the simple carbohydrate categories, some of these foods do have starches in them, which actually are complex, but we consider them simple because they may have a lot of the fiber component removed um, during the milling process. So starting with our simplest carbohydrates, we have the monosaccharides. And it's definitely important to know the differences between the monosaccharides, the disaccharides, the polysaccharides, etc. So mono means one. And the three monosaccharides we have are glucose, galactose, and fructose. And they actually all have the exact same chemical configuration or chemical equation, meaning they all have six hydrogens, 12, sorry, they all have six carbons, they all have 12 hydrogens, and they all have six oxygens, but they're arranged in a different way. So while they have the same number of the different elements, they're arranged in a very different way, which gives them different shapes and different functions, as you can see. Glucose is otherwise known as blood sugar or dextrose. Fructose is otherwise known as fruit sugar or levulose, less commonly, and it's found in fruits, honey, and different saps. And then galactose is not commonly found as a single sugar, but appears as part of the disaccharide lactose. Disaccharides include maltose, otherwise known as malt sugar, and maltose has two glucose units, so maltose is a glucose and a glucose. Sucrose is a disaccharide, and sucrose is otherwise known as table sugar, B12, 
beet sugar or cane sugar, and sucrose is made of a glucose and a fructose. Sucrose is very sweet tasting. Maltose is not as sweet tasting. And then lactose is composed of glucose and galactose, and this is known as milk sugar, and milk sugar is also not that sweet. So of the disaccharides, sucrose is the sweetest one. How do we make disaccharides? So in order to make disaccharide, we combine two monosaccharides. And the reaction is called a condensation reaction because water is lost in the process. So you can see the very top, we have a glucose and a glucose combining to be a maltose. Middle, we have glucose and fructose combining to be sucrose, and then galactose and glucose combining to be lactose. And something interesting about the disaccharides is that you find glucose as a molecule in every single one of them. It just depends on what else is bonded to glucose that differentiates the disaccharides from one another. How do we split apart a disaccharide and what do we have left? Well, we can split apart a disaccharide by adding water back to it and that will produce two monosaccharides. So this reaction is called a hydrolysis reaction, and it can be performed by adding water in the form of two hydrogens and an oxygen back across this bond that had connected the two monosaccharides. It will break that bond and form two single sugars. Complex carbohydrates include the polysaccharides, meaning lots and lots of sugars, or many monosaccharides linked together, and these include glycogen, which is the human or animal form of glucose, storage form of glucose, starches, which are plant storage forms of glucose, and fiber, which is generally indigestible to humans. In some of these pictures, you can see complex carbohydrates. They tend to be um, whole foods as well as different starches. Glycogen. So glycogen is what humans and or animals use as their storage form of glucose. And it's a long polysaccharide, meaning lots of glucose is connected together. In humans, we store it in our liver and muscles and it provides us energy when we haven't been eating for a few hours. Um, and the opposite of glycogen is starch. Starch is not stored by humans, but is how plants store their glucose. And so starchy foods contain a lot of starch and um, don't have as much, well, it depends on the food, but many starchy foods don't have that much fiber. However, you can see beans, and beans are both rich in fiber and starch, as well as nuts. But bread, especially this white bread, white rice, kind of plain cereals, would be high in starch, not high in fiber. If you had whole grains, they would contain both. Glycogen and starch compared. So although they're both made up of glucose molecules, they're arranged very differently. And there are two different types of bonds that occur within starch. You can have amylopectin, where the starch forms a more linear shape or organized shape, or you can have amylose, which is a single chain of sugars. So amylose is a single chain where amylopectin has these multiple organized branches. And then glycogen is the animal or human storage form for glucose. And it is also a very, very branched molecule. Fiber. So I hinted a little bit to what fiber was. But fiber is not starch, <laughs> however, it is a large sugar molecule, meaning there's lots and lots of sugars that make up fiber. And humans do not have digestive enzymes to break up fiber, but we do have bacteria that live in our gastrointestinal tract that can help break up fiber. And many animals have bacteria in their intestinal tracts as well as may have some of the enzymes themselves to break up fiber. There are two different categories of fiber, and they're classified based on their solubility in water. So the first type of fiber is soluble fiber, and it includes gums, mucolages, pectins, and some hemicelluloses. 
Pectin gums and mucolages occur inside of, for example, this apple. And so if you were to mash up an apple, if you were to peel it, mash it up, you could make applesauce. It's very, very watery, very kind of liquidy. You could mix it with water and the parts would disperse. So it's very viscous. It is fermentable by bacteria in our small intestine, and this type of fiber helps protect us against heart disease. It can also bind to bile, which is made by our liver, secreted by our gallbladder, and in that way it can help lower cholesterol levels. It also helps keep us full and can provide satiety. Insoluble fibers are the outside of the apple or the outer husk of a whole grain, which is shown here. And insoluble fibers include cellulose, lignans, resistant starches, and different types of hemicelluloses. So insoluble fibers will not break up in water, meaning if you were to peel an apple and then mash it up, the part that you had peeled would still remain whole in water, where the inside, the soluble part, would mix easily with the water, but the peel would still float on top. Same thing with the whole grain. This is the outer kind of roughage of a grain, and it won't dissolve in water. It's non-viscous, meaning it does not mix well with water. Therefore, it's slightly less fermentable, but it does help with bowel movements. It helps add a lot of bulk and create movement through our intestinal tract, so it's very important. You see the grain pictured here, and when they mill grains to make white rice or white flour, like I just showed on the other slide, they get rid of these insoluble fibers, and the only thing that's left is the starchy part. So some grains that have been milled will not have a lot of fiber, but instead will just be made of starch. How do we digest carbohydrates? So mm, there are carbohydrates that we eat raw, such as some fruits and vegetables. However, some carbohydrates we cook before eating, such as starches, like in pasta or as we make bread or rice. And as we cook those starches, another example would be baked potato, the starch molecules will soak up water and they'll swell. And that process makes them softer and easier for us to break down and digest and absorb. Once we do start eating our carbohydrates, whether they're starches, fibers, simple sugars, complex sugars, the first place of digestion is in the mouth. And the mouth is where we have mechanical digestion via the chewing process. So if you're eating foods that are very fiber dense, you're going to want to chew them a lot so that you can help break up those fibers and expose them to different enzymes as well as bacteria in your large intestine where they can be fermented. Saliva also moistens carbohydrates so that it can be swallowed more easily. And we do have one enzyme produced in the mouth called salivary amylase. It's produced by the salivary glands and it's amylase. And so it can break down amylose and create small polysaccharides and maltose. We don't have a significant amount of carb digestion happening in the mouth. This is like less than five-ish percent, but it does occur a little bit. After the mouth, food will travel through the esophagus down into the stomach. And in the stomach, we have additional mechanical digestion happening, as well as we have hydrochloric acid that can help break down carbohydrates. Then food will travel to the small intestine where multiple enzymes will be secreted by the cells of the small intestine, as well as the pancreas itself. The pancreas will secrete pancreatic amylase, which can break down starch and the cells of the small intestine will secrete maltase, sucrase, lactase, et cetera. The way that these enzymes are spelled indicates what they break down. So when you see an enzyme, you know it's an enzyme because it has A-S-E at the end, and the beginning of the enzyme name is what it breaks down. So maltase breaks down maltose, sucrase breaks down sucrose, lactase breaks down lactose, et cetera. As food moves through the small intestine, 
um, some of the simple sugars will begin to be absorbed across the cells of the small intestine where they will then travel to the liver and be packaged or different places. They'll go to different places such as be stored as glycogen, be used for energy, or turn into fat. What is not broken down in the small intestine will travel to the large intestine. This is where some fiber can be broken down by bacterial enzymes. Bacteria actually can break fiber down into short chain fatty acids. So although humans can't get calories from fiber, as the bacteria break them down, they produce small fats, which we are able to derive calories from. These fats have also a lot of important properties in the human body and some vitamins are also made by the bacteria in the large intestine. So digestive enzymes. I mentioned previously that you see ASE at the end of an enzyme, and that indicates that it is an enzyme, and then the beginning of the enzyme name indicates what that enzyme is breaking up. So you have maltase, sucrase, and lactase, and you can see what they are breaking up. How are sugars absorbed? So I mentioned that sugars will start to be absorbed in the small intestine, and they will do this through generally simple diffusion across the enterocytes or intestinal cells. They can then travel to the liver via the portal vein, which is the main vein that feeds the liver. The liver is our main metabolic organ. And in the liver, the liver will decide whether we're gonna use these sugars for energy, for fat, or to be converted to glycogen. So after all of these simple sugars that you just saw in the last slide have been absorbed, what is kind of left to pass on to the large intestine? Well, hopefully you remembered what I had talked about and I mentioned that it was fiber. Fiber cannot be broken down in the small intestine nor absorbed or digested there. In fact, humans cannot digest it at all. We rely on bacterial enzymes to digest it and break it down for us and convert it into things that we may be able to use. What's not converted into usable material is excreted in the stool. And so this is just a picture of the digestive system starting at the top and then ending at the bottom. And you can see the lower we get in the digestive system in the large intestine, we have all these different species of bacteria. And many of these bacteria serve many purposes um, to our bodies as well as help us break down some of this fiber. Oh. So this is just another diagram kind of explaining a similar thing that I just did, but specifically looking at fiber versus all carbohydrates and tracking fiber through the digestive tract. Like I said, it's very important that we chew our foods. That can help us break down fiber, mix it with saliva, expose its area so when it does reach the large intestine, bacterial enzymes will be able to access it. And then we do not absorb or digest fiber in the stomach or large intestine. Um, it travels, or sorry, the stomach or small intestine, it travels to the large intestine where bacterial enzymes can break it down. Lactose intolerance. So you may have heard of lactose intolerance and lactose intolerance is actually a deficiency in the lactase enzyme. And remember that the lactase enzyme is the enzyme responsible for breaking down the disaccharide into monosaccharides. So lactase would break down lactose into glucose and galactose. But in lactase deficiency, people don't have this enzyme or they don't have adequate amounts of it, so they can't break down lactose into the monosaccharide components. Lactose travels whole or intact to the small intestine. It's not able to be absorbed across the intestinal cells and people can get gas, discomfort, diarrhea, abdominal pain, etc. Milk allergy is different than lactose intolerance. Lactose intolerance is an inability to digest a carbohydrate or sugar within milk, but a true milk allergy is actually an allergy to a protein within milk. And people who are lactose intolerant 
may be able to actually consume dairy and milk products, but people who have true milk allergies will have much more severe reactions to dairy or milk and should avoid them. Lactose content in selected foods. So like I said, some people who are lactose intolerant may be able to tolerate some foods that do have lactose in them. And you can see different lactose concentrations of different foods listed here. Some foods uh, have bacteria in them that can help break down some of the lactose. So although yogurt is quite high in lactose, there are some bacteria in it that can actually break down some of the lactose itself. They also sell different products that are lactose free or have had the lactose already broken down. For example, there's a product on the market called lactate milk. And those can be beneficial for people who want to enjoy dairy but not have to worry about unpleasant symptoms. So after carbs have been digested and absorbed, what can the body do with them? Maybe you were paying attention as I talked about what happened to the monosaccharides after they went to the liver, but the body can either use them for energy, it can store them as glycogen in the muscle and the liver, or it can convert them to fat. After the body has used up the glucose supplied by the foods that you eat, how does it continue to provide energy to the cells between meals and overnight? Well, hopefully you remembered that I said that we can store glucose as either glycogen or fat. Glycogen will provide us energy to last maybe two to four hours, depending on the person. And fat will provide us weeks, months worth of energy if we have it. If we are sleeping and we're not eating, we can start to break down our glycogen to convert it to glucose because the brain does prefer to use glucose for energy. If we have not eaten for a really long time or we're following a really low carbohydrate diet and we have depleted our glycogen stores, we can start to break down fat. As we break down fat to use for energy, something called ketone bodies are formed, and our brains can actually adapt to use ketone bodies for energy. Gluconeogenesis. So in the absence of glucose or carbohydrate intake, we can make glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. So we can do this from certain amino acids, um, as well as from some of the components of triglycerides, such as the glycerol backbone. When there is no glucose, so what will happen? If we are not consuming any glucose, our body doesn't really want to break down protein because protein has so many important roles for immunity, enzymes, antibodies, blood pressure, cell production, et cetera, that we would prefer to break down fat. We also don't have excess protein stores in our body. Our excess protein stores are in the form of muscle and it wouldn't be, a very good adaptation if we broke down our muscle to use as energy if we didn't have to. And so instead we break down our fat to use as energy. So that's exactly what the body will do. However, as the body breaks down fat, it's not able to convert it very efficiently to glucose. And so what happens is the production of ketone bodies. And ketone bodies, there's actually three different ketone bodies that can form, um, but they can change the pH of the blood. In certain situations, this can be quite dangerous. Um, however, the brain can adapt to use ketone bodies for fuel. And so in healthy individuals, if you have not consumed carbohydrates for a significant amount of time, your brain can adapt to use ketone bodies for fuel and you can be in a period of ketosis. In type one and type two diabetics with inadequate insulin production or regulation, it is possible that ketosis can kind of go to extreme levels and cause these changes in the pH of the blood, which can cause some metabolic issues, can cause breathing problems, and can actually be fatal. So for diabetics, being in ketosis is a little bit more dangerous than for people who are not diabetic. Um, 
And the reaction that a diabetic would have to inadequate carb supply, meaning they're either not eating it or it can't get in their cells, um, is much more severe than the reaction to that same situation, well, to no carb consumption of a non-diabetic person. The body does like to use carbs as energy, and so in order to prevent ketosis, most people need about 50 to 100 grams of carbs per day. However, some people may need even less than that, and so some people may not actually be in ketosis until they're consuming maybe 20 to 50 grams of carbs a day. So how does the body maintain glucose homeostasis? Glucose levels in the blood are very important because glucose is how the cells produce energy. And without glucose, the cells cannot produce energy and the cells cannot function. So it's very important we keep adequate levels of glucose circulating in the blood so that it's available to the cells. It creates homeostasis, our body does, by maintaining multiple kind of checks and balance systems. So if blood glucose falls, we respond hormonally. If blood glucose is too high, we have a different hormonal system that responds. And a lot of this has to do with insulin and glucagon, as well as some additional hormones. If you were to have your blood sugar tested in a lab, they recommend that you do a fasting blood sugar, meaning that you have not eaten since dinner the night before and you go in in the morning. And a normal fasting blood sugar would be 70 to 100 milligrams per deciliter. So I mentioned that our body uses these two main hormonal systems to regulate glucose balance in the cells. And insulin is a hormone secreted by beta cells in the pancreas. And we secrete insulin in response to increased blood glucose concentration. There are other reasons why we may secrete insulin, but this is the main reason that we secrete insulin. So for example, if you were to eat a big bowl of pasta or a candy bar or a bowl of ice cream or something with a lot of carbohydrates, maybe a piece of fruit or a soda, that would cause your blood sugar levels to go up. And in response to that, the pancreas would secrete insulin. So insulin responds to high blood glucose. And what insulin will do is it will allow glucose to go inside the cells, which will allow the cells to create energy, and it will also bring down circulating levels of blood glucose. So in this way, insulin decreases blood glucose levels. The opposite hormone to insulin is glucagon, and glucagon will be secreted when blood glucose levels are low. What glucagon will do is it will increase blood glucose by causing glycogen to be broken down by the liver. So remember, as we break down glycogen, we have glucose molecules. So the hormone glucagon will increase blood glucose levels if, say, we have not consumed any carbohydrates for a long time or even overnight when we're sleeping. There are other hormones that play a role in this balance as well. However, we won't go in detail about them for this class, but some of them include epinephrine, norepinephrine, otherwise known as adrenaline, um, cortisol, etc. Epinephrine works to increase blood glucose because epinephrine is your flight or flight flight or fight hormone, meaning if you were in an emergency situation, your body releases epinephrine, and in an emergency, you would want as much glucose available to your cells as possible. This is a picture depicting blood glucose homeostasis. So you can see how step one, somebody is eating, maybe they're eating a carbohydrate food, those carbs are absorbed across the intestinal cells, they travel through the portal vein to the liver, into the capillaries, etc. As blood glucose rises, insulin will be secreted. Insulin allows glucose to get into the cells and the liver will decide whether we need to use that glucose for energy, for glycogen, glycogen storage, or for fat. 
Once the blood sugar levels have come down a bit, say you have not eaten for a while, then glucagon will be released, which will cause the liver to break down glycogen and deposit glucose back to the blood to raise it. Diabetes. So I'm sure many of you have heard of diabetes or been affected by diabetes yourself or potentially know a friend or family member who has been affected by diabetes. Um, it's unfortunately quite common. There are quite a few types of diabetes, but the most common types of diabetes are type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. In diabetes, we don't control that blood level as effectively as we like. And so instead of having homeostasis where everything is balanced and kept under control, we might have too low blood sugar or we might have situations of too high blood sugar. Type 1 diabetes was formally called juvenile onset diabetes because we only saw it in children and this was the only type of diabetes that children got. However, we don't call it juvenile onset diabetes anymore because now some children are actually developing type 2 diabetes. So it's possible to see children with either type 2 or type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease, so that means the body attacks itself, and what happens is the beta cells of the pancreas are destroyed so that they do not produce enough insulin, and in the majority of cases, they don't produce any insulin. People with type 1 diabetes, because they don't produce their own insulin, the glucose has no way to get into their cells, and so they have to rely on insulin injections via multiple daily shots or maybe a insulin pump so that they can get glucose into their cells. Type 1 2 diabetes is not autoimmune in nature, meaning the body does not attack itself. Um, and there's many different factors that play a role in the development of type 2 diabetes. Age increases risk, obesity increases risk, sedentary lifestyle increases risk, metabolic syndrome increases risk, family history increases risk, certain types of diets increase risk as well. And in type 2 diabetes, the pancreas does produce insulin, but either it doesn't produce enough or that insulin isn't very effective at getting the glucose into the cells. And so many type 2 diabetics need diet or lifestyle modifications to help improve their insulin sensitivity. Depending on the cause of type 2 diabetes, Diet and lifestyle modifications may be enough to actually reverse type 2 diabetes or allow a patient to be symptom free. However, if diet and lifestyle aren't enough, a patient will generally start on oral medications that have many different mechanisms of action. And if oral medications don't work, it's possible that a type 2 diabetic would also need to use insulin. So what would be normal for blood sugar? Like I said, when you go to a lab, they would draw a fasting blood sugar, and normal would be 70 to 99. I think the last slide said up to 100, um, it's kind of borderline. But anything between 100 to 125 would be considered pre-diabetes, and diabetes would be anything that is 126 or higher. If this happened just one time, they would probably want to redraw the lab a different day to confirm and then follow-up testing would be done. This is a picture of a blood glucometer or blood glucose meter and people who are diabetic or wanting to check their blood sugar can prick their fingers and take a tiny, tiny little drop of blood that actually feeds onto this little monitor, this AccuCheck part on the bottom, and it will read their blood glucose level pretty quickly. Hypoglycemia. So hypoglycemia means low blood sugar. And symptoms of low blood sugar include weakness, rapid heartbeat, sweating, anxiety, hunger, and trembling. Usually these symptoms will occur at a blood sugar below 70. However, some people might not be symptomatic until lower. And this can occur if somebody has poorly managed diabetes, maybe if they have not eaten and they've taken too much medication, maybe they've performed exercise that was way too strenuous, uh, maybe they've been sick. 
Um, this can be life-threatening in diabetics. For people who are non-diabetic, we don't usually see this turn into life-threatening situation. Glycemic response. So we can look at foods and we can look at the extent to which food raises blood glucose concentration. And this measurement is called the glycemic response. We assume that if blood glucose levels rise, then insulin would also rise in kind of a parallel line to blood glucose. However, we don't actually see a perfect relationship between insulin and blood glucose all the time. So the glycemic index is actually a little bit more complicated and less functional than it was originally thought it would be. The idea of the glycemic index is that you could categorize foods based on how high they raised your blood sugar, and you could pick foods that cause slow rises in blood sugar or don't have a very high effect on your blood sugar, and thereby this would help with managing diabetes. Um, however, there's only kind of moderate evidence to this working. Health effects of sugar. So, Sugars in their natural form, I think, are fine. Sugars in their added form are not good, are not fine for anybody. Um, simple sugars have no nutrients, so sugars that are added to foods have no nutrients and will only contribute to chronic disease. So diabetes, heart disease, obesity, um, nutrient deficiencies, like I said, sugars don't have nutrients. Dental caries, which are cavities, Every time you eat a carbohydrate containing food, that carbohydrate can cause acid production by bacteria in your mouth for 20 or 30 minutes. So the more carbohydrates you eat, the more acid production you have, the more chances that you're gonna have cavities. What is the recommended intake of added sugars? So it is 10% or less of total calories each day coming from added sugars. And on your diet analysis project, you'll actually have a chance to look through the foods that you eat and determine which foods had added sugars or were considered empty calorie sugars, and then determine if this contributed over 10% to your total calories. I think a better goal for this would be zero, but hey, we all love sweets once in a while, so let's go with 10%. But the reason to limit added sugars is because, like I said, they can contribute to multiple chronic diseases and they are very low in nutrients. One of the main sources of added sugars is sugar-sweetened beverages. And so a can of soda has eight to 10 teaspoons of sugar, and it's usually about 35 to 45 grams of sugar. How much sugar are we eating? We are eating way too much sugar. And so we're consuming 105 pounds a year of added sugar which is the equivalent of 30 teaspoons every day. So that is way, way, way too much, especially because of the adverse health outcomes. And this pie chart represents the main sources of sugar in our diet. So the main sources are not healthy foods. The main sources are soda, energy drinks, sports drinks, grain-based desserts, fruit drinks. 100% fruit juice will contain a lot of sugar, but if it's 100% fruit juice, it's better than just a juice drink, which may only be like 5% fruit juice. It still does have a lot of sugar though, so you have to be careful. Candy, dairy desserts, sugars and honey, um, and then some other foods as well. I mentioned multiple times that sugar does not have a lot of nutrients. So on the bottom of this table, you can see different types of sugars, white sugar, molasses, Coca-Cola, and honey, and the different nutrients it has. Molasses is actually surprisingly okay in nutrients, but you have to eat a lot of molasses in order to get the nutrients compared to other different food sources. Um, molasses is also high in potassium, interestingly enough, although potassium is not on this chart. But looking at all the other sugars here, they have no protein. Um, the other ones barely have calcium. They don't have a lot of iron. They don't have vitamin A. They don't have vitamin C, etc. Where if you're eating 
more natural sources of carbohydrates, which are pictured at the top, you're going to get all these other nutrients. So I don't personally think carbs are bad. I think added sugars are bad. High fructose corn syrup. So high fructose corn syrup is something that is added to just about every product in the commercialized food market out there, unless it specifically says no high fructose corn syrup. Um, but high fructose corn syrup is produced by processing of regular corn syrup. And interestingly enough, a regular corn syrup is about 50% fructose and high fructose corn syrup is only about 55% fructose, so it's not actually that high, but like I said, it's added to everything. It's very inexpensive, it's easy to use from a culinary standpoint, it's very soluble, it's very stable, it has good moisture, resists drying out, it doesn't crystallize, it doesn't support a lot of microbial growth, and it blends really easily with other sweeteners. So from a culinary food science standpoint, it's a very beneficial pro product. From a nutritional standpoint, we are about 99% sure that it is not, and it is also contributing to much of the chronic disease, obesity, etc., that we're seeing. Alternative sweeteners. So why would you want to use an alternative sweetener? You may want to use an alternative sweetener if you were diabetic. And I'm not saying that all diabetics should use these. I'm just saying this is actually the original use of these products. This is what these products were created for, for people with diabetes to be able to enjoy the sweet taste without either getting the calories or having the increases in blood sugar. Um, you might want to use them if you're trying to reduce calories. So maybe you want to suck on a candy, but you don't want to have your mouth exposed to sugars that are going to create acid. Maybe you want to consume these because you're trying to lose weight. Well, the science on that is a little bit up in the air, and some studies have even shown that these can contribute to weight gain, but it's quite controversial right now. There are many different types of artificial sweeteners out there. Some of them are listed here. Aspartame is one that's been around for a really long time. Saccharin, sucralose, you don't see saccharin that much anymore. Stevia, stevia comes from a plant whose leaves have been used for thousands and years, thousands of years. Um, stevia is on the grass list, which is generally recognized as safe. And then sugar alcohols. Sugar alcohols do occur naturally in some fruits and vegetables, but they can also be added to products to sweeten them. And we're only able to get about two calories or less per gram of sugar alcohol compared to regular sugars. Um, and they don't raise blood glucose as high. However, if you consume a lot of them, they're incompletely digested, so they can cause some significant gastrointestinal side effects. These are artificial sweeteners and what you can look for on the label when you're identifying artificial, artificial sweeteners. Um, like I said, a lot of these were marketed to reduce tooth decay and one in particular is xylitol. If chewed on a regular basis, gum that has xylitol in it, which is a sugar alcohol, it actually does contribute to reduction in cavities. So there are some potential good uses and benefits from these products. Just think, so how much starch should we eat each day? Um, these are pictures of starchy foods, and some of these foods pictured actually have fiber too because these seem to be more whole foods, less processed foods, but how much starch do we need a day? When we think about starch specifically, I think I'd rather phrase it how much carbs do we need a day? And as far as carb intakes go, the AMDR for carbohydrates is 45 to 65% of total calories each day, which usually amounts to about 200 to 300 grams of carbohydrate. Many people will enjoy following lower carbohydrate diets than what the AMDRs outline. And I think that low carb diets can absolutely be okay and health promoting as long as the diets are carefully planned so that people get enough of the nutrients. Sometimes I see low carb diets being very low in fiber and very low in certain vitamins and minerals. So health effects of starch and fibers. 
Um, starch and fibers both play beneficial roles. More specifically fiber, I would say. Fiber is much more beneficial than starch, but a lot of the foods have both in them, so we can talk about them. Um, but fibers play a role in reducing heart disease. They can help with cholesterol lowering. They can help with blood pressure, diabetes as far as blood sugar control, appetite management, weight management, gastrointestinal health. High fiber diets help reduce risk of colon cancer and can strengthen the GI tract so that people have lower risk of something that's called diverticulitis. Um, cancers, I mentioned cancer, and so high fiber diets can reduce risk of colon cancer. High fiber diets also tend to be high in antioxidants and polyphenols, which are compounds that can be found in plants and have kind of anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory properties. Weight management for satiety and fullness. If you eat meals that are high in fiber, you can feel full longer and maybe not need to eat as frequently. And recommends, recommendations for fiber are 25 to 35 grams. So again, as you do your diet analysis project, you're going to record your intakes and you'll be seeing how much fiber you consume on a daily basis, and if you're meeting these goals. In part two of your diet analysis, you're actually gonna be trying to meet these goals. So you're gonna to have to create a diet that's high enough in fiber to create the fiber recommendation that's specific for you. Dietary fibers. So these are sources of dietary fibers. So if you are creating your menu for these diet analysis type projects, you might refer back to these tables if you are low on fiber. And you can find sources of both soluble and insoluble fiber, as well as some of the health benefits of them. I think this would be a pretty good table to focus on kind of the differences between soluble and insoluble fibers and the health benefits of each, as well as some sources of each. These are additional tables that depict sources of fiber in foods. I actually really like this one because while fruits and vegetables are rich in fiber, they're actually not that high. And I think this is a common misconception is that if people eat a couple fruits and veggies a day, um, they're gonna get enough fiber. But most fruits and veggies only have two to three grams per serving. So you would have to be eating a lot of fruits and veggies, 10 servings total per day, which great, you should probably be doing that anyways, but most people don't, to get adequate fiber that you need. And so people need to turn to other areas for fiber if they're having trouble meeting their goals. And legumes, nuts, seeds can be great sources. Lentils, peas, et cetera, can be great sources. Really planning a diet where every food you eat that is a plant-based food contributes some fiber will help you meet your daily goals. This is a picture of different labels that you may see at the supermarket when you're choosing different breads to buy. And you do see a lot of labels that can be a little bit confusing. And so things that you wanna look for are whole grain, but specifically you want to look for 100% whole grain or 100% whole wheat. And most products will actually advertise this on the front, but if you don't see it on the front, for example, if it just says wheat, you need to flip it around and look at the ingredients to see is it whole wheat or is it refined processed wheat? Um, or like on the left, is it 100% whole wheat, which would be much better. This is a picture of a grain on the right, which you already saw this picture before, but in a whole wheat or a whole grain product, you're gonna get this entire seed or this entire piece of wheat, this wheat berry, I guess they're technically called, where in a product that's been milled, you're gonna miss a lot of the bran um, and the germ where the vitamins, the minerals, and the fiber are contained, and you're only gonna get the endosperm. So reading the labels can help you improve your fiber content and get the most bang for your buck when it comes to carbohydrate intakes. Quiz, yay. Carbohydrates are found in virtually all foods except for meats. Disaccharides, remember that means two, include which molecules? 
Hopefully you said sucrose, maltose, and lactose, C. The making of a disaccharide from two monosaccharides is an example of what type of reaction? A condensation reaction. The storage form of glucose in the body is glycogen. The significant difference between starch and cellulose is that human digestive enzymes can break the bonds in starch but not cellulose because starch is starch and humans can break down starch and cellulose is a type of fiber and humans cannot break down fiber. The ultimate goal of carb digestion and absorption is to yield glucose. So all carbohydrates are broken down into glucose or their simplest sugars. The enzyme that breaks a disaccharide into glucose and galactose is lactase because a molecule of glucose and galactose is going to be a lactose molecule and so you need a lactase enzyme to break up this molecule with insufficient glucose in metabolism fat fragments combine to form ketone bodies what does the pancreas secrete when blood glucose rises when blood glucose falls so when blood glucose is high, we secrete insulin, which can help bring it down. And when blood glucose falls, we secrete glucagon to bring it back up again. What percent of the daily energy intake should come from carbohydrates? So according to the AMDR, it is D, 45 to 65%. All right, guys, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed. See you next time.